Greetings, uh, First Virginia Avenue Missionary Baptist Church family, and all those that are joining us, uh, that are our friends and loved ones. We're delighted that you joined us for our midweek Bible study. This is a service that we record each Tuesday evening, and then it's broadcast on Wednesdays uh, in place of the noon Bible class that we had for so many, many years. We're here tonight, and we'll be following the same schedule that we usually do. We'll have a selection from the praise team, led by uh, Brother Louis Lipscomb, prayer and scripture from the deacons, another selection, and then we'll do our Bible study. Thanks again for joining us, and we trust that what's done and said tonight will be a blessing to each and every one that participates. God bless. Remember 
your right, my God. God is still on His throne. Good afternoon, church family, and all the listening audience. Our scripture for this day will come from Psalm 24, beginning at verse 1. It says, The earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. For he had founded it upon the sea, and established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend in the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that had clean hands and a pure heart, who had not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive the blessing from the Lord and the righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob. So lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Yes, lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. I read Psalm 24 verses 1 through 10 in its entirety. May the Lord add a blessing to the readers, hearers, and doers of his word. Let us pray. It's once again, Lord, that we come just thanking you for who you are. And that's God and God all by yourself. We thank you, dear Heavenly Father, for another day's journey. A day that we've never seen and a day we'll never see again. We are grateful, dear Heavenly Father, that you woke us up this morning. We thank you, dear Heavenly Father, that as we looked around, all was well. And even though some may have got a call that said a loved one didn't make it through the night, or one that wasn't here this morning, Lord, you are still great to be praised. We thank you, dear Heavenly Father, for giving us another opportunity to come out and to study and to share your word, not only within us and in our hearts, but in also in the ones that are watching and listening to this as we speak right now, this service. Lord, we are grateful that you have also given us the ability, Lord, to comprehend what we hear and what we read and to apply it to our everyday life living. Oftentimes, Lord, we we wonder about how this world, the change is going to come. And we know, dear Heavenly Father, that your word has already said that you can do anything but fail. Lord, you the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And Lord, whatever our problems is, all we have to do is put them in your hands. And we know that you are, you'll never let us fall. Lord, we thank you for our pastor. We ask that you continue to just give him strength. We pray, dear Heavenly Father, a special blessing for the Perriman family, Lord. Lord, our hearts go out to him. Uh, not only was he a pastor, Lord, but he rendered service in the neighborhood as a mortician. And Lord, we just pray, Lord, that you would just wrap your loving arms around his family. We pray, dear Heavenly Father, for the Thompson family. Lord, we pray that you would bless Doug, you bless Tish and other members of the family and allow them to know, dear Heavenly Father, that weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Father, we know that we all have to leave this way unless your son returns. And Lord, we know that we all just a step away from death. So we ask that as we walk, Lord, that you would order our steps, Lord. We pray, dear Heavenly Father, that we would keep our minds stayed on thee and then help us to love more than 
we've ever done before, Lord, because that's what's going to cure this hatred in the world. Nothing but love, because that's what your son, Jesus Christ, is all about. Lord, we ask that you bless this group of men here, individually and collectively, and give us what we stand in need of. Now, Father, we ask the one that's going to bring the lesson tonight. I pray, dear Heavenly Father, you just give him a word, dear Heavenly Father, that will help us to become better Christians than what we are. Father, help us to be that beacon of light on this corner of 3600 Virginia Avenue. Let us give others a hope that they may not have to know that there is a joy in serving a true and a living God. Lord, we forever give you praise, we give you honor, and we give you glory. And we ask your Heavenly Father, you forgive us for our many sins. For this is our prayer in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.
What joy shall fill my heart? Then I shall bow in humble adoration and then proclaim, my God, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings sings my soul, my Savior God God to to thee. How great, how great, how great thou art. Greetings again and welcome to the First Virginia Avenue Missionary Baptist Church Midweek Bible Study. On behalf of Pastor Charles Henry Duncan, Sr., we want to say that we're glad and delighted that you've joined us and trust that we uh, will learn something here from the lessons as we continue our study in the book of Isaiah. Uh, As I said one, a couple of weeks ago, I think, Isaiah was uh, classified or designated as the holiest man in Israel. And the prophecies and the things that he has presented and that he's written uh, in this book is what we've been studying for the last three or four weeks. And today we are dealing with the, a lesson out of the 51st chapter of the book of Isaiah entitled, God Offers Deliverance. The situation and the, the matter of the study has indicated just how important and how precious the word of God is as it comes through the prophets. Because this particular lesson that we are dealing with today, uh, the prophecy was presented by Isaiah some hundred years before the events were scheduled to take place concerning their deliverance. We've studied uh, things concerning God indicating to the people that he will provide for them. And today, out of the 51st chapter, uh, we see that, well, the title of the subject for study is God Offers Deliverance. When we think about being delivered, it, would, it implies or it conjures up the thought that under some condition we have been restrained or restricted and the the shackles or the bonds or whatever have been released, uh, removed, and as a result of that, we ought to be a little freer or in a position to function a little more freely than we were able before uh, the interference was uh, uh, removed. Uh, Brother Martin is, is probably familiar more so than most of us today concerning just that particular thing for those individuals that run track or participate in track and field events. Practicing and training for these events, in many cases these athletes 
will use weights on their ankles and so forth in order when they are practicing and working out. And therefore, when the actual event takes place, they kind of feel like a feather and just kind of float down. And that's the idea. And to be delivered is something that is precious. And it comes to us in this particular text from none other than God himself through the prophet Isaiah. One of the preliminary presentations in this particular study that we have in our Sunday School Quarterly has to do with a young man that had found himself running into problems with the law or with legal involvement. And I don't know what the details were not spelled out, but it appears that for some reason he wound up being an individual that is spotted or, or pointed out and has been under investigation many times. And he was proud enough to think about the fact that he had been delivered, which is what we're talking about, deliverance, by Almighty God. And he was trusting his faith when a third or fourth event had taken place, one that was much more serious than the ones that he had encountered in the past. And everyone thought that this one was going to be a toughie. And uh, some of his friends said to him, plead guilty, even though he knew he wasn't guilty, that was in order to get a shorter sentence. And he says, I cannot say yes to something I didn't do just to try to move these weights and so forth from my uh, sentence that may come, uh, come down as a result of the legal action. So true enough, they found him guilty, and he wasn't guilty. He went to prison and was there for two years before the truth came out. And all of us are familiar with situations of that nature because we find people or we hear about people every day because of the DNA and, and different tests nowadays discovering people who have been imprisoned 30 and 40 years and they get delivered. And I don't know about you, but uh, it, it takes a strong constitution, a strong dependence and leaning on Almighty God in order to receive these the strength to get through something like that. And this is exactly what this man uh, in that uh, focus of the text presented in this lesson today. And when he got out of prison, he was like a free bird, but he wanted to tell all of his friends, God did it again. So when we trust him and we trust God, he will deliver us and uh, we must never give up uh, the fight. Well, the text starts, uh, begins in chapter 51, and in the first verse, it says, Hearken to me, ye that follow after righteousness. Ye that seek the Lord, look unto the rock whence ye are hewn, and to the hole of the pit whence ye are digged. Hearken. It's take note. Stand up, uh, listen, because there's something coming down the pike or something is happening that you need to take into your mind and your heart and govern yourself accordingly in order that you will receive the blessing that God has for us. God has not promised to us that this, this life of being what we consider and call a Christian is one that's a, a flowery bed of ease or a bowl of cherries or peaches and cream, but there is something that it should be in the back of the minds of everyone, like the gentleman that was sent to prison wrongly, uh, was falsely accused, and simply that we can remember or have the dependence on Almighty God to deliver us, whatever the case might be. There are individuals that you might have had some experience with that have lived a saintly life, and later in life, they find themselves in a hospital bed, maybe being visited by hospice, or have been given the information from the medical staff that we've done all we can, and we, we're just waiting on, a, on time. And you, and you are here, even though everything we've been doing for you is all that we know to do. And at this particular stage in, in the life of an individual in a position like that, may be that the pain relieving medication no longer proves to be effective. They still have a smile on their face because they have what? A consciousness of 
possible deliverance from Almighty God in the back of their mind. So Isaiah is presenting to them, to Israel, this very thing. And God has constantly passed on to not only Isaiah, but the other prophets to indicate that he would deliver them. And he always tells even the children of Israel um, when they were out in the wilderness, remember, I rescued you from Egypt. Then he says concerning what Isaiah has been talking about, not only did I rescue you from Egypt, I also rescued you from Babylon, from Nebuchadnezzar and the Chaldeans and their, uh, their vicious way of, of imprisoning people or, or taking you captive into their land and causing you to develop techniques and operations of life that are in line with the Chaldean philosophy. Well, this particular lesson that, that, that Isaiah has written or that, that's here for in the 51st chapter spells out exactly that. So be not dismayed. Remember that I am God. And if I have promised you that I'll deliver you, you can count on it. God is never early. He's never late. He will all, but he'll always deliver right on time. Verse 2 says to us, look unto Abraham, your father. And unto Sarah that bear you. For I called him alone and blessed him and increased him. He points out an example of Sarah, Abraham and Sarah. When Abraham had been called out of the land of Ur of the Chaldeans, God didn't tell him where he was going. He didn't know. He just followed the instruction. And that's a lesson for us in another way there, because God doesn't always tell everything. And when we have what he gives us, that's enough. That's enough for us to have the dependence and the faith in him to understand that he has the power to deliver. Those other things will come along when God feels that they are right for us. And that's why he says that he's a, he's, he's a light to your path. He, it's, it's not a a floodgate of light down the road that God wants you to travel, but he uh, provides a spot for each step. And until you take one step, you, the lighted path isn't present for you until it's time to take the next one. And it's when, when the light spots the next step, that's the direction you are to go and to follow. And we lean and depend on God. We can be benefited by the things that he provides for us day by day. Individuals in the scripture, like Gideon, uh, out there in the wine press threshing wheat. And the angel of God comes to him there because he, he is to be, he's chosen to be one of the judges to rescue the people after there was no leader, after um, Joshua dies, and the, the, the judges come on the scene. Well, Gideon is out there th thrashing wheat because the Midianites, with their bovacious, thuggery kind of attitude, destructive attitude, come in and take your crops after you've labored to grow them up, run their camels across and destroy all of the food and so forth that you have. Gideon wants to have some food, uh, some bread, to, to something to make some grain to make some bread for his family. And normally when they thrash the wheat, they'd go on a high on an elevated area and uh, they toss the grain and wheat up in the air. And the husks being lighter when it, on the wind on the ele elevated plane or elevated hill or whatever would blow the husk away and you get the grain fall into the ground. So if you're down in a wine press in a valley somewhere, Thrash and wheat would indicate, conjure up in your mind that there was some cowardice. There is something there that shows that there's not a belief strong enough to say that I'm going out there regardless of the Midianites and their camels coming by and taking my grain and my trampling up my field. So you're hiding. And this is exactly what Gideon was doing. The surprising part with Gideon was that the angel of God said to him, mighty man of valor. I think Gideon almost passed out. He knows that he is being a coward. He's hiding in the, down in, the, in a valley to thresh some wheat when 
normally you do it on a hilltop, and the angel comes and calls you mighty man of valor. In the mentality that we have as human beings, we only attach such titles to individuals after they've accomplished some dastardly or brave feat. Uh, and then we, we give them credit for being a person of valor, being a person that is a hero. But in God's view of things and his classification of things, it's not after you have performed, it's what you can and will perform when you do it God's way. And under those conditions, the angel of God says to Gideon, mighty man of valor, and he wants him to come out and lead the people. Uh, he had all kind, you know, about the fleece and all those things. That's another message. But anyway, he, he was, this is part of what we need to understand and realize. It's in the picture that Isaiah is trying to point out to the people that God's going to provide for you. He brought you out of Egypt. He rescued you and brought you out of Babylon because he loves you and he wants, after you've served your time uh, for not being obedient, now it's time when Cyrus has allowed, after, has, has overrun Babylon, it, Cyrus has given them a chance to leave and to go back and build the walls and build the, the temple, the uh, tabernacle temple again. And here he is pointing just that thing out. And he wants you to be bold and brave when you consider these things that, have, uh, that are taking place. When God says things of this nature, like back again to Gideon, uh, he, he, we have to remember that God operates in the present all the time. We think about the past, the present, and the future, but Almighty God is always, everything is present. When he says to us, he's going to do something immediately, and if, it's, if that's 3,000 years ago, that's immediately to God. It's all present tense. But here, So that's what Isaiah is trying to point, to, point out to the people. So in verse 3, he says... <clears throat> For the Lord shall comfort Zion. And that's, that's just a reference to, the, to Israel, to Jerusalem, the, the, uh, the, the, the major city for the Israelites. Uh, he says that the Lord shall comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places. And he will make her wilderness like Eden. Can you imagine? The Hebrew children should remember or know something about that, though well, everybody that was in the wilderness is probably dead by this time. But if they passed on the words of wisdom and the experiences that the children had out in the wilderness, they know how devastating it was. <clears throat> what a struggle they had and their complaints for water and for food and all that type of thing. And then to compare that with Eden, the garden where God created and placed Adam and Eve, what a contrast. And this is exactly what Isaiah is saying to them. If you follow the instruction and, and the, the, the plan that God has for you, you're one moment in the wilderness like the children of Israel were for 40 years. And the next moment you're in the Garden of Eden, utopia, a utopic place to live. Isaiah is saying to him, following God will produce that kind of thing for you. So when we think about life itself, life can't be, in last Sunday's lesson, he dealt with it. He says that God will make the, the high spots level with the low spots to the point where the road that you travel will not be valleys and mountains, but it'll be a level plain for you to travel on. And that's really just a description of what life is itself. If we had to stay or we had the opportunity to stay on the mountaintop all the time, we probably would implode <laughs> or something. We wouldn't be able to stand it because the glory that would be there of, on the mountaintop day in, day out for the full lifetime would be something that's over and beyond what these human bodies would be able to experience. So we, we get strength after going through the valley. But when God is bringing to you a, re, a deliverance, then he levels out the path that you're traveling in order that you receive what he has for you and you can travel with ease because he says, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. But you say, well, how in the world is a yoke easy? 
The difference in the yoke that we have on when we yoke up with Jesus is that the yoke that Jesus has fits perfectly. The problem with the animal, the, the oxen and, and the, the, the donkeys and all were carrying and pulling the weight. In many cases, this was just a yoke that the owner had, and it didn't fit perfectly. But the yoke that Jesus gives each and every one of us will fit perfectly so that when, whatever move you make, there will not be irritation, that you won't get blisters and irritated skin. So God said, Jesus says, my yoke is easy because it fits perfectly. I don't know about you, but if you've ever put on a pair of shoes that didn't fit well and you had a long distance to walk, you were really, really, really thrilled to get to a place where you could take them off, to give your feet some relief. This is the kind of, can you imagine an oxen out there plowing in the field trying to work with, with, the, with a yoke that fit his big brother? And it was rubbing. Every time he pulled, it, it created an abrasive situation. But at the end of the day, he had nothing but sore spots on his body. But Jesus said, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. It's simply because Jesus is providing for us the exact fit that is necessary. His fit for you is just for you. His fit for me is just for me. <clears throat> And if I'm wearing the yoke that God has provided for me, then I need not worry about irritation from the rough spots in the road or the, the extra uh, snag that, that the plow might hit with a, with a log or something in the ground. Because God said, Jesus says, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. It's because it's tailor-made for the situation and tailor-made for the person that is wearing it. In verse 4. Hearken unto me, my people. In other words, there is that, that, that word again. It just means listen up. You know, you hear these messages at the time, hear ye, hear ye. I want you to pay attention. There's something coming down the pipe that is of importance. And you want to have your ears cleared and tuned and focused in the direction in which the message is coming from in order that you'll be able to uh, receive it and understand exactly what God wants you to do. Um, there are good times and there are bad times in every life. And that can be d explained in the mountains and the valleys. But when we have the acceptance of Almighty God and his deliverance of us, it's like the lady I, talk, I said about in, or in, this lying in a hospital bed when the doctor said they've done all they can do. The medicine they're giving her is not easing the pain anymore. But she is understanding at that point that she's in the hands of Almighty God the yoke's easy, the burden's light. The pain is something that she can push away because she's thinking about the fact that God is delivering or going to deliver her from all of this. Well, within a short period of time, she'll be in the atmosphere with none other than Jesus the Christ. And that means no more tugging, no more wearing of ill-fitted yoke or shoes on your feet. Okay, verse 5, my righteousness, he says, is near. And that's how, and that's what the person feels when they are in a devastating position, but yet and still they can see the light from heaven to indicate what God has for us. His righteousness never wavers. The things that we experience in life wind up being things that pull us down, pull us to the right and pull us to the left. But the, 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 the salvation and the righteousness of Almighty God is always cut and dry to the, well, cut and dry, but it's, it's exact to a point where there's no problem at all. My mercy and justice are coming soon. And that's the attitude you, you see these people have that are at the point of death and they still have a smile on their face, body wrecked in pain can't move, or if you move them, they probably squeal because they're, they're filled with pain, but they have that understanding that at that point that the salvation out of the righteousness of Almighty God is, is just there at the inter intersection, let's say, and they are feeling strong enough to make it over to that point. Uh, verse 6. Lift up your eyes to the heavens 
and look upon the earth beneath. For the heavens shall vanish away like smoke, and the earth shall wax old like a garment. And they that dwell therein shall die in like manner. But, God says, my salvation shall be forever, and my righteousness shall not be abolished. Peace in the midst of infirmity is the atmosphere, it's the surrounding, it, it, it's, it's what encompasses one who has surrendered their all to God. Well, sometimes we get it and sometimes we don't. And let me paraphrase or parenthetically point a picture of a story that I heard. It's a little boy on a flight and they developed a terrible storm. The plane was being tossed around in the air like a paper plane on a string. The people were crying and praying and hollering and squealing every time the plane dipped and dived and turned and tossed around. And, and everybody was doing everything except one little boy sitting over there in the corner with his little book. And he was just calmly there reading. Somebody walked up to him and asked him, aren't you, aren't you afraid? So we may die. This plane is going. He says, my daddy is the pilot. And I, I have no fear. And when we have that assurance, if our God Almighty is the pilot of our life, regardless of what the storms might present, we need not fear because daddy is pilot in this plane. And the little boy wasn't concerned. He was in danger just as much as the rest of them. But he had the confidence and he, he, my daddy knows I'm back here. <laughs> oh, yeah, he knows wherever we are. And since dad knows I'm back here, everything's going to be all right. He's going to do everything he can to make sure that I'm OK. Well, it seems that what we do in many cases is we try to take into our own realm of correction, own realm of division and dis decision making for the road we travel. And since we aren't able to see past the first mountain peak that's in front of us, there's no way we can determine how devastating, how high, and how treacherous the second one might be, or even how sweet it might be, simply because we're too close to the forest to see the trees. And the matter that we have to face in life when we face situations of this type is that we must take one step at a time according to God's direction. And that's exactly what he does with the light of our path. Where he wants me to step the next time is where he hits the spotlight. He, he doesn't illuminate the path for the next 20 miles, just where I'm to step the next time. And until we do what he tells us to do and take that step, we don't get the light on the next spot of the path. Trusting and depending on him for guidance and direction because the righteousness of God is something that will never, never lead any of us astray. So he says there in verse 7, again, hearken or listen up. Listen to me. Ye that know righteousness, the people in whose heart is my law, fear ye not the reproach of men, neither be afraid of their revelings. Whatever 45 <laughs> conjures up in his room of evil thought need not disturb us because we are in the path that God wants us to follow. I'm not saying that every step is going to be easy. Every bite of food won't be peaches and cream. But we know that the path that God has designed and laid out for us, we just follow that part and step in the spot that he wants us to step, step by step, one step at a time. He'll get us to Rome safely without any conflict or any problem at all. So he says, listen up or listen to me. 
you who know right from wrong, you who cherish my law in your hearts, do not be afraid of people scorn, people lying on you, people denying you your natural born rights, your privileges and to function and to vote and to do things that, that are part of what is supposed to be your constitutional right and privilege. Do not worry about that because ultimately God's in his righteousness is going to, is going to take care of all this. So, so have no fear of the scorn and the insults that come from the people that are following the pattern of the evil one. And then the last verse that we have for study today is verse number eight. It's for the moth shall eat them up like a garment. And the worm shall eat them like wool. But my righteousness shall be forever. And my salvation from generation to generation. In other words, he says, for the moth will devour them as it devours clothing. The worm will eat at them as it eats wool. But my righteousness will last forever. My salvation will continually be there, generation after generation and after generation. We could say amen to that, but I, let me tell you this about me before we close this study. There was a time in my life that I thought that any matter concerning and involving me had to be straightened out by no one else but me before the sun went down. It didn't matter with me how big you were, what your sex was, who your mama was, your daddy was, and if I was involved, you had to answer to me before the day was over. I didn't understand that it wasn't John Malone that designed Armageddon. It wasn't John Malone that decided what the final test and what the final path would be. It's a matter of where God wants me to be and where God and how he directs us. So when we are following the pattern and the instruction that uh, Isaiah is giving, following and understanding that the path that God has designed for us is one designed out of righteousness and love for us. When we understand that, then regardless of what these bodies might experience, be racked in pain, I can still rest at ease and say, my father is piloting this plane. <laughs> my father is taking care of them. He knows I'm back here in the plane, so why should I worry? And when this is not just like an earthly father, the father, the maker, the creator of everything. And Isaiah says, this is the deliverance from the oppression the last time of 70 years being in, in bondage in Babylon, 400 years being in bondage in Egypt. Now he says, listen, God says, my righteousness will deliver you. You can receive what I have for you because you are my child and I love you and I want to deliver you. And, to live it. and when God delivers us, there is no second move. That's a lesson that we had for study. It comes out Sunday. I trust that uh, in some way this helps us to understand more about the love of God and what he has planned for us and how we can react to it in the midst of storms and still be filled with love and patience and joy. God bless. you. <laughs>
It bathed my heart in love And it broke my name above And just a little talk with Jesus made me whole Now let us have a little talk with Jesus We will tell, tell him all about our troubles will hear our faintest cry, and uh, he will answer by and by. Now when you feel a little prayer will turn, and you know a little fire is burning, you will find a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Sometimes my path seems drear Without a way of cheer And then the cloud is the thing night of day The mist of sins may rise And hide the starry skies but just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Now let us have a little talk with Jesus. We will tell him all about our troubles. He will hear our faintest cry. And he will answer by and by. Now when you feel a little prayer will turn in. And you know a little fire is burning You will find a little talk with Jesus makes it right I may have doubts and fears My eyes be filled with tears But Jesus is a friend who watches day and night I go to him in prayer, he knows my every care, and just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Now let us have a little talk with Jesus, we will tell him all about our troubles. He will hear our faintest cry, and he will answer by and by. Now when you feel a little prayer will turn in, and you know a little fire is burning, you will find a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Well, it's all right. 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 Just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. It's all 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 right. Just a little talk with Jesus. Makes it right. Oh, Just a little talk with Jesus makes everything all right. Yeah. Uh, we need not worry. We surrender all to Him. This brings to a close our midweek Bible study here at First Virginia Avenue Missionary Baptist Church. And as I said before, on behalf of Pastor Charles Henry Duncan, we're delighted you joined us. Trust that something has taken place here in the song, the prayer, the scripture, and the exegesis of the material for the Sunday School lesson might be something that enlightens you and directs you along the path, understanding and realizing that God is planning to or has already planned to deliver you and me or all of us from the clutches of the devil and the sin that we experience in this life. And just a little talk with him gives us that reassurance that all is well, all is right. So this brings you a close. Let us go to God in prayer.
Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this day and for the opportunity that you've granted unto us to one more time assemble here in the house of worship to study your word, to sing the praises of Zion, to give you thanks for those things that you do for us much, much above and beyond what we deserve. And we ask, Almighty God, that you continue to strengthen us, give us, forgive us of our sins and our transgressions, Use us to be what you'd have us to be as ambassadors in this cruel world to let the world know that we know, love, and serve the true and living God. We'll forever give you praise and we'll give you thanks for it's in the powerful name of Jesus that we offer this prayer. Now may the grace of God, the love of Jesus, the communion of the Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide with each and every one until we meet again. It's in Jesus' name that we pray and we all sing. Let the church say amen. Let the church say amen. God has spoken. Let the church say amen. Let the church say amen. Let the church say amen. God has spoken. Let the church say amen. Amen and good night.